You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the OptionsInsider.com and co-hosts, Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster, Joe Venazzi, and Mark the Greasy Meatball, Sebastian from OptionFit.com. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Option Block, everyone's favorite bi-weekly source for all things options related. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as of course from this here Options Insider Radio Network. Quite a few programs for you guys to choose from on the old network and you can find all of that of course at the website of course the optionsinsider.com. Click on the Insider Radio Network tab there, top left corner of the homepage and you're off to the races. Of course, while you're there, Click around, read some breaking news from the options market, check on some usual activity, a lot more than we have time to get to on the program here today. And of course, some education, some analysis, some what's trading in the marketplace, wrap it all up in a nice little bow, and you have the optionsinsider.com. Of course, you can also find our radio content pretty much wherever you find your finer podcast programs, including iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, et cetera, et cetera, and of course, also via our mobile app available for iOS, Android, and the Fire OS. So no shortage of ways for you guys to download and stream our stuff. And while you're listening, fire off your questions, your comments. We love to hear from you guys. All right, and joining me on the program today, starting off with the man beaming in from scenic and lovely and ever-temperate St. Charles, Illinois. You know him, you love him as Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Wealth Advisors. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the Option Block program, sir. Always happy to be here on a Thursday. But you're not happy to be here on Monday, just Thursday, just to clarify. Well, I guess I'm happy on a Monday. I'm always happy, so you never know. <laughs> you're a pretty jovial fellow, so I think I think you qualify as happy on pretty much all of our recording sessions. And also joining us from the other side of the planet, the globe, the hemisphere, a.k.a. the hinterlands of Maine. None other than the Rock Lobster himself, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi, from a few appearances on the old network, including you can catch him daily, every day, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the TD Ameritrade platform. Just hop on over into the Swim Lessons room, and you can find him right there for our Options Oddities program, recorded every day live, noon central, like I said, 1 p.m. Eastern, right over there at TD Ameritrade. You have to be a TD client to check that one out, but of course, if you can't do that, you can always check out the archives. They go up about a day or so later over there on our website or iTunes or pretty much wherever you find our network content, Options Oddities is there as well. So no shortage of ways for you guys to listen to the Rock Lobster, including on this program today. Mr. Rock Lobster, welcome back to the Option Block, sir. Uh, it is. It is fantastic to be back in the land of the block. It is always good to be blocking. Thursday is a good day to do some blocking. I think without further ado, let's dive right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Trading Block. This is indeed the portion of the old program where we break down what's moving, what's shaking, what's catching our eye in the marketplace today. A lot of things lighten it up today, mostly to the downside, mostly lighten up to the red today. We are recording this Thursday, August 6th. For all of you playing the home game out there. And like I said, see a red on the board today. Most of the major indices off 
pretty uh, substantially, not over 1%, at least not most of the major indices. We'll get to the Qs in a second. Uh, but most of the major S&P, not off a full percent, but instead about, oh, about three quarters of a percentage point or so, or about 14 and a half handles. To the downside, uh, the Dow, a bit of a laggard, only off six tenths of a percentage point today, or a little bit over 100 handles. And leading the charge to the downside, the NASDAQ 100 off one and a half percent today on the day, so an aggressive day, aggressive sell off over there in NASDAQ uh, tech land. And of course, all this red on the screen means there's a little bit of green out there in good old volatility land to the tune of the BIX cash, ticking up another point or so, actually about a point and a quarter today. For those of you percent of percent fans, that works out to a little bit over 10 percent on the day today, closing today right around 1380 or so on the day. So we're still in the low teens. But we're threatening up there with the 14 handle. No longer are we are we vacillating and threatening perhaps to break through the 10 handle to the downside. Not this week, at least. So a lot of stuff uh, firing off today. Before we get into all that, we'll just check in with each of our cohorts here. See what caught their eyes. Uncle Mike, perhaps we'll start with you. There has been a lot of action, a lot of moving and shaking uh, in your particular necks of the woods, including some former Next of the woods uh, for you, of course, gold has had some action of late. Also, your former chief holding Apple ever since pretty much ever since you said you were washing your hands of it has been on a bit of a tear to the downside. The closing actually unched today, which on a day like today, when the rest of the market is selling off pretty heavily, is actually pretty good. Actually ticking up about three tenths of a percentage point or so now uh, to a little bit over one fifteen right now. But I, like I was joking with you earlier, Uncle Mike, once the market got wind that you were no longer the diehard Apple devotee you once were, uh, it just hasn't looked back. I know. I mean, I just I, I called up all the wealthy bankers in New York and I said, hey, we're selling. So that's what they do. So um, not really. But a lot of things going on right now. Yeah. Apple's down right now. Uh, not a lot today, but I, I believe. Yesterday and the day before, we had some pretty significant down days in Apple. So uh, once again, if you're an Apple in Apple, and let the what made them go up was innovation and something really cool. And unless they come out with something cool, they're not going to go up. They might not go down. They might be more of a Microsoft type stock where it just stays the same for 10 years, but they're probably not going to go up. Moving on in gold, not a lot of action there today. It did come up a little bit, but nothing too impressive to speak of. Uh, in the S&P, we had a down day today. I got into a put spread today on the dip. Uh, still not buying calls as of yet, waiting till we touch the all-time highs before I buy some calls. But here's the thing that, I, from on, on a market note, that I noticed today and that just kind of affected me personally in a little bit, in a, in, to an extent, uh, we're moving right now, or we moved recently, and so I'm getting all my stuff set up in terms of the new cable, the new phone, well, even though we're not getting a phone, uh, or we never haven't had a phone in many years, actually, but just all the stuff that you're going through when you're moving. So I reanalyzed uh, my cable service, and with it, we have a very basic package, and uh, quite honestly, why would I want to watch TV when, number one, I live in St. Charles, and number two, I have the Options Insider app on my phone anyway? What's the point of watching TV? But Just nonstop content, 24-7, baby. That's what I was thinking. But uh, one thing that I did miss, I remember last fall, is I didn't have ESPN in the package that I have. And it was like, I don't know, why I have the real cheap thing, and I didn't have ESPN in my cable package. And I'm thinking, you know, I missed some football games, and you know, I might want to see those on occasion when I'm not watching the, uh, looking at the options inside or, or enjoying sunny, scenic St. Charles, Illinois in the outside. So upon doing research and doing this type of, and doing stuff along those lines, I came across something called Sling. And so with that, with Sling, you can pay them $20 a month, and basically you can get ESPN, ESPN2, and a bunch of other channels for like 20 bucks a month. So for my cable package, I basically have internet, and I have the local channels, CBS, NBC, ABC, and I wanted to get rid of the local channels and just get an antenna, but Comcast makes it so if you do that, they make their internet service higher. And in my area, Comcast basically has a monopoly. Don't get me started on that, by the way. Uh, but nonetheless, that's what I did. So today, uh, a lot of talk throughout the media today is what's going on with uh, Disney and that most subscribers or most cable channels demand maybe $1.50 per subscriber. And, Dis and Disney for ESPN, because Disney owns ESPN, for those of you home gamers out there, ESPN actually demands, I believe, it's $6.50 per subscriber. 
So with all that involved, we're really coming to an interesting potential metamorphosis in the cable world in that what's the point of cable if you can – I had no reason to pay Comcast $80 a month just to get ESPN. That was the only cable channel that I wanted. When I can do this through Sling on my smart TV, they actually sent me a free um, – a Roku stick or whatever, even for it for prepaying for three months. And I can get it for $20 a month that way. So I think that it's going to be an interesting time and that things might be shifting and that we might be able to customize our cable in a lot more ways going forward because of the fact that we have so much content and the ability to do all these things online. That is, of course, when you're not watching the Options Insider app, when you're not using the Options Insider app. Of course, uh, that caveat is a given, sir. But Uncle Mike becoming uh, quite tech forward here in your post move days. You're becoming what they refer to in the business as a cord cutter, Uncle Mike, someone who gets rid of their cable and ditches it in lieu of some uh, online I'm not a cord services. Cutter. I'm a cord shaver. Cord shaster. You haven't got rid of all of it. You still have some of it, but uh, I do have some of it. I'm a cord shaver. So cord I learned shaver. the difference between that throughout this experience. <laughs> but so. you'll be getting there soon enough. You got a Roku stick. You're running Sling Media. You're you're coming into the modern era, Uncle Mike. So. So it's a pleasure to see that this technology is reaching the paradise that is St. Charles, Illinois. Mr. I might Andrew. Even start sending a text message. Who knows? Whoa, whoa, now you're getting crazy. Now you're catching up to like 1997. That's a little bit too crazy for you, sir. One step at a time. Uh, Mr. Andrew, same question for you, sir. In addition to all this cord cutting madness, what caught your eye in today's activity? Uh, well, I, th- you know, just there was like the looking at the MLP space this morning. Just just a lot of weird nastiness going on, like a lot of very I'm just going to call it isolated volatility in places. You know, Mike was talking about the cord cutting like Viacom, Discovery, all those. A lot of those names are like down 10 percent at one point today uh, when everybody's freaking out about their income streams from content. Right. So this normally happens where you know everybody's freaking out about where that money is going to come from. And then all of a sudden. Um, you know, they find all kinds of other outlets for their content, trying to, you know, get money from they can't get it from the cable companies, they'll get it from somewhere else. So but right now that definitely looks like an industry where all of a sudden you, you've been hearing cable cutting forever and now smack. Uh MLP land this morning, all the you know, those those gas upstream, downstream, they were hitting all the good ones, the bad ones, whatever. So there was I think there was some localized uh volatility, really extreme where these things are moving 10 or 15% or more in one day and then bouncing right back up again. So it just very, very, um, very odd activity just, and, you know, and just the market selling off. Um, and I, again, I think what my, Mike has a good point of, it's hard to really want to get long. You know, he's, he's not, I'm a, I'm not a buy along not a long call buyer long. I will sell some put spreads every once in a while type of long, which are two different types of longs. Meaning one is you just don't think things are going to go down a whole bunch. And the other means you think they're going to rip. And right now it's just, there's, they're running out of reasons to take the market higher. And, you know, you're not seeing much help out of financials. It's hard to imagine tech making much more of a run than it already has. And, uh, and then you have a big slice of the market that's still kind of getting hammered a little bit as far as oil and natural gas and those types of stocks. I just, I just think we're in for a little bit of churn, maybe a little bit slightly higher vol, and you're going to have to find some stocks that look interesting, uh, you know, to make any money as far as on the upside. Um, except of course for Netflix, which seems to go up no matter what. Netflix. <laughs> Except for Uncle Mike cutting the cord. They're still doing pretty good. Everyone just switching and realizing, hey, I can spend 7 whatever, $10 a month, and I can get all these cool shows, and they don't have to be live. And so I guess that's a big driver in their earnings. Just to, just to reiterate, Uncle Mike, before we move on to some other things, I know people are going to write in, so I'm just going to ask you now. People, you, you haven't, just because of the recent 15 handle or so sell-off in Apple, this hasn't caused you to to re uh, readjust your thinking on it. You haven't written any 105 puts or anything like that. Just to, just to preempt, I know the legion of emails we're going to get down the road. I have to admit that I have looked at it, but still not writing any puts on it yet. Wow, just wash your hands completely. There you go, listeners. I asked your question, so you don't have to. Going back to 
what you were just talking about before, Uncle Mike, there has been some names this week uh, coming out, earnings season still in the teeth of it, and a lot of stocks getting crushed this week, uh, lending themselves to that aggressive sell-off we saw today. Of course, one of them, Uncle Mike, was just referring to Disney uh, on the receiving end of a decent walloping, a thwacking, call it what you will, from the old market. They closed, they had earnings on the 4th, they closed going into earnings about right around 121. They were pricing that at the money straddle, right around four bucks, uh, so about three and a half percent or so move. And what do we get is actually a fairly aggressive sell off to the downside, off 2% just today, a total of 10% since the earnings over the past two sessions, a uh, trading today right around 108 half or so. So again, yet another example of a high profile name blowing through its straddle. Uh, pretty aggressively uh, so and, and of course if you want another name that's uh, known for moving and blowing through straddles well look no farther than tesla that one closing prior to their earnings yesterday uh, 270 dollars uh, that at the money straddle going out about 22 22 and a quarter or so so a little over eight uh, percent priced in over there on tesla and so far today uh, it sold off over 10 percent down about 28 handles so yet another one blowing through a straddle not as aggressively as disney or some of the other ones we've seen just because the tesla straddle is always so inflated but still even with all that inflation going into it and all the extra bit of juice we've seen uh, being pumped into these straddles in the wake of Amazon and Google and Netflix and all these others just blowing the doors off everything to the upside and the downside. Uh, it still is not enough in some of these names to really compensate for what we're seeing, a bit of a rocking and rolling earnings season, which is, at least from an options perspective and, and selfishly from a show content perspective, a little bit fun to see. I'm sure a lot of you out there are, are excited about it as well because we actually have some action, some ball to trade. Uh, Mr. Rock Lobster over there in the pitch chat, any of these names, a uh, Disney, a uh, Tesla, and the, other, and the others that are firing off this week, uh, really lighten it up over there in the pitch chat. Anyone really actively trading them over there? Uh, we were looking at uh, Disney... We looked at some time spreads yesterday. We didn't do anything. We looked at some selling some short-term premium in them today. We didn't do anything mostly because uh, we're still moving around a lot. <laughs> so, uh, and we'll see tomorrow, uh, you know, how it holds up. We just, so it's like we watched it and waited and kind of didn't do anything. The Tesla, I thought, uh, was pretty fair for $20, and apparently it was a little cheap. So, I the only problem with Tesla is I think we did try to talk about selling some upside, but I couldn't get that excited. And mostly because no matter how bad Tesla earnings are, somehow Elon Musk always comes out and says something to jack the company up again. So <laughs> it's kind of hard to, you know, I don't know how many times he can do it, but since he's Iron Man, uh, he can do whatever he wants. Yeah, so far that PR strategy has worked pretty good for people who just load up on upside out there in Tesla. This time, not so much, but you're right. Maybe they can they can talk it back up. And just looking here at Disney uh, get, and we've, keeping in the theme of back up, they actually got as low today as 104 and a quarter. So they they sold off fairly aggressively intraday before gaining back about four handles of that to close at 108 half. So it was a even more aggressive sell off out there in Disney. Uh, the options numbers are reflecting that. It's a name that's been averaging about 41,000 contracts a day, doing 350,000. Uh, today and remember today wasn't even earnings day it was, it was a couple of sessions ago so uh, it's just still feeling uh, the effects of that and given up pretty much most of the rally that they've had uh, you know they broke through the hundred handle uh, back earlier this year in february and uh, reach giving up almost all of that over the past six months in just the last couple of sessions uh, so uh, interesting stuff out there the future for disney interesting one uncle mike pointing out of course, uh, the ESPN problem, that's one people have been talking about for a while. But they have a lot of other, such a big conglomerate. They have a lot of other areas that are firing on all cylinders. Of course, the movies are doing well. They have great properties there. Their gaming division is starting to do well for the first time, I think, in that company's history. So there's so many moving parts out there in Disney. It's hard to say which one trumps the others. But, of course, ESPN is a big one. And if they can't keep charging those premium dollars for ESPN, the stock will suffer, as we've seen so far today. Speaking of some stock suffering and perhaps just some others, just up to some weird stuff, it's time for us to keep on rolling right on into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by theoptionsinsider.com. It's time for the odd block.
All right, everybody, that funky tune means it's time once again for the Odd Block, the portion of the program where we tell you what's catching our eye, what's moving and shaking out there from a, shall we say, a bit weirder options activity perspective. We're going to kick things off with all scripts, healthcare solutions, ticker symbol, MDRX. This is the name that actually closed today about 14 and a half or it's actually 1440. So off about 1% or so on the day, moving pretty much in lockstep with the market today. It's the name that does about 1500 contracts a day, doing a fair share more than that, doing about 12, nearly 13,000 today. And what caught our eye out here was some paper a little bit farther out, a little bit, a little bit farther down the old expiration cycle to the tune of the December 16 calls. When we first started writing these up on the website, again, all these alerts we talk about here on the show, listeners are all profiled on the optionsinsider.com, as well as many more we don't have time to get to on the old program today. And when we first started writing this one up on the site, we profiled 10,900 of these D16s going up, paper selling for an even 50 cents. They went up in one block over there on the ARCA with a price variation tag. Again, normally that tag indicates a trade with stock, but we didn't see any stock uh, of any real, any size uh, going up with this. So at least it doesn't appear to have been uh, delta neutral. As the day went on, 12,611 went up total. Uh, That's on open interest of 12,571. So almost exactly equal to the open interest. And when we see something like that, particularly when there's no other open interest to speak of anywhere near it, at least in this expiration month, uh, it tends to reinforce the notion that this is perhaps a closing call seller. Uh, Mr. Rock Lobster, do you concur with that, that this is indeed a closer? I mean, it's, it's very rare that we see the OI and the volume line up as nicely as they are here in MDRX. I, I I agree. I think it is a close. But don't you find it interesting that they're closing this volume now? That's why we call it the odd block, sir. It doesn't have to make sense. Oh, oh, oh wait a minute. I, that's, okay. Okay. I'm not sure I if you're I'm not sure part. if you're following along with the tone of this segment. I, but I, uh, I'm sorry. I forgot. I forgot. What show are we doing again? Oh, the odd block. It's not the sensible paper block. It is the uh, <laughs> It's not the, the other side of the makes coin. Total freaking sense block. <laughs> That'd be a good name for the block. It makes total freaking sense block. Who would tune into that? <laughs> That's like what I do on oddities, you know. <laughs> like, why do people do these things? And I say, well, it's called options oddities, not you know, <laughs> options really smart people doing stuff. Clever branding there. Yes, I very 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 funny. Who thought of that show? Anyway, so I think. It's either it's that or somebody's writing the exact same amount on top, and that's as near as I could tell. It, you know, and if they're taking the trade off, maybe they're thinking some upside. You know, there's this is our big market pullback. We're down one percent, and everybody's covering their short calls right away. So, who knows? Somebody's got the wherewithal to sell twelve thousand calls, though. So they must have made some money from somewhere. So how could I, you know? <laughs> How could I argue with Looking that? Looking at that chart here, it has had a few recent pops. It popped back in May on earnings, like about a, a handle or so. And it did it again out here recently in uh, July going into the earnings cycle. Sold off a little bit since then. So uh, perhaps he missed his timing if he was indeed looking for the, the best exit. Or maybe he was waiting for the announcement. Came out. Didn't seem like it really budged the stock that much. And so our friend said, yeah, I'm, I'm, discretion is a better part of Balor here. I'm taking my 50 cents and I'm going elsewhere. Speaking of going elsewhere, moving on to our next name, our next victim. Call them what you will here on the very sensible options segment <laughs> known as the odd block. Uh, where this is, a, this is our frequent offender here. It's been on the show a few times in the past six months or so. This is Noble Corporation PLC, ticker symbol NE closing today, $12.38, up about 70 cents or nearly 6%, one of the few green names on the board today and otherwise sea of red. And what we saw out here was, first off, this is a name that does about 5,100 contracts a day, doing nearly, nearly 8,000 today. So lighten it up. And a lot of that come in on the very, very, very near portion of the old curve. In particular, what caught our eye were the old AUG-12 puts, not the weeklies, but the old regulars coming in 
paper, lightening them up to the tune of about 3,000. Yes, 3,000 exactly. Paper selling for 60 cents. That's pretty much the lion's share of what we saw. A couple couple other contracts filtering in after that, but 3,000 being the main volume there. Going up in one block again on the ARCA. Busy day over there on ARCA. Again, marked price variation. Speaking of these trade tags, a lot of you have been writing in again saying, hey, what do these, what do these trade tags mean? What does all this stuff mean? Well, we answered that for you. You can find it if you go on over to uh, the optionsinsider.com and just search for you know trade tags or what do these trade tags mean. We have several articles that explain it precisely over there. And if you prefer to get your content in this form, in the audio format, then we even did a whole radio show about it. It was episode 56 of our Options Bootcamp program. In fact, Andrew guest starred on that program, and we went into all things trade tag so for all you guys who are writing in and it's a regular question hey what does this tag mean what does price variation mean what does that mean check out episode 56 of options boot camp or just search for trade tags on our website and you'll find those articles and hopefully that will get you where you need to go getting back to the uh, the ne options activity this is another strike with some sizable open interest, actually almost identical open interest, about 3,300 contracts open on this strike against today's 3,000 contracts worth of volume. Uh, again, no stock going up with it, even though it went up stock, excuse me, price variation. So it seems like this could be yet another one of our friends perhaps getting out. Uh, not when the getting is good so much because the stock rallied a bit today, uh, but of late it has been on kind of a bit of a downward bent, including coming out of earnings and uh, continuing its ever inexorable trend to the downside. Maybe our friend deciding enough is enough, and today's bounce was his clue to get the heck out of Dodge on some long puts. Mr. Rock Lobster, where do you fall on these? you think this is additional volume? I think our friend is deciding, again, perhaps questionably, to get the heck out of these uh, long options here. I think this might be the theme of the odd block where people are taking today's dip and, you know. Why the heck are you closing? <laughs> that should be today's title. Why the heck are you closing? Why are you closing? So I think that, you know, the put guy maybe, you know, this, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of punditry about this is the bottom for oil today. It's the bottom. And you got some bounces in Exxon and uh, a lot of after just an ugly morning, a lot of these names rallied pretty hard like rig. Um a lot of explorers uh, and uh, production companies rallied pretty hard after just getting uh, just decimated lately. So this put buyer, uh, they certainly I couldn't see them rolling it. So I think they're maybe they're just taking their money and, you know, hitting the road. Um, and that's that's it. I mean, the price variation normally could be a short put in stock, but it feels like a little iffy position, you know, this far down the bottom of the curve like that. So I, I guess they're just taking their money, man. That could be the name of the show. That could be another title for the show. Taking your money and running, taking your money and hitting the road. Uh, perhaps they're savvier than we give them credit for. <laughs> they're not throwing good money away after bad. Either way, uh, we have one more to hit on. That's kind of in a, a similar vein. going to rack things up, staying in the energy realm with uh, XOP. That is the Spider S&P Oil and Gas Exploring and Producing ETF. Uh, trading today at thirty eight dollars and thirty seven cents up about a buck sixty two or four and a half percent so again, some of these energy producers some of the few some of the few greens on the board today. This is one of the more active ones we 're going to talk about here today It does about fifty three thousand contracts a day doing a whopping seventy four nearly seventy five thousand today and amongst that sea of activity, we plucked out one nugget. For your listening and reviewing pleasure, in particular, it came out here in September, a little bit, uh, a little bit farther away from home. Not playing in AUG, not playing in Dece, just a nice little Goldilocks porridge of duration here. And in particular, this was the SEP 36s that caught our eye again on the website this morning. Starting off, paper selling looks like about 3,500 of these SEP 36 calls for 261. As the day went, well, that first off, that first kind went up in one block on the SIBO again on a price variation tag again without any stock. Again, that's why we say these tags don't live or die by them. They don't always, they aren't always as insightful as you may think. Uh, as the day went on, the volume piled into the tune of 10,000 
and 45 total on the day. Again, on open interest, almost identical. 10,025 open on this strike. So this looks like this could be some fortuitous closing. Uh, looks like there were some trades going up yesterday, paper buy-in in the two and a quarter range. So this is indeed our friend uh, flipping after one day. He did all right. He made about 35 cents or so. Uh, not bad for one day's work. Usually we see it around the other way. People buy a ton of upside calls and then it just erodes to nothing in a day or two. Uh, at least our friend here caught a good bump today and perhaps deciding, you know what, I'm taking my 35 cents and hitting the road. So, Mr. Rock Lobster, I ask you one more time here in the odd block, why is he closing? <laughs> I I think they're I think they made a couple of bucks and they're hitting the road. And after I think they closed, the stock launched XOP launched a little bit more. Again, it's all around this oil and gas stuff. Just that there was so much volatile like I would all just call localized vol. It's almost like somebody giant is getting out and just making a mess of these names uh, right now. I mean, if you're a, like a long-term investor, a lot of opportunity. But right now, I, I mean, you got you, – you see this volume. They they did okay on these things. I mean, these sub-36 calls closed 345. I don't think they got that good a price on them. But I think overall they did okay. I think there was a little cold feet at the beginning as well. Um, you know, just trying to get out for two. So I think they made some money uh, and they're taking it just saying uh, I, this bounce is too hard. I'm taking it and I'm going home. I'm going home with my money. You have all of the mysterious closes we're going to discuss uh, on the odd block today. This one, not so much. This one makes sense. Take your money and run. Uh, I salute you, sir. So many of others we profile on the old the odd block don't have that uh, that frame of mind to do it and they end up they end up paying the piper quite literally. In this case, uh, taking the 35 cents or so and running, I've seen worse trades. And speaking of worse trades, maybe we'll find some right now because it's time for us to keep on rolling. It's Thursday. It means it's time for the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Mail Block. You guys know the drill by now. This is the portion of the show where you guys get to join us on the old program, make your questions, comments, insights known to us here on the old All-Star panel, as well as to your fellow listeners. No shortage of ways for you guys to do just that. Find us on the website, theoptionsinsider.com, hit us up on the feedback form or just leave a comment on one of the articles there and we'll route it to the appropriate show. Of course, find us via email, questions at theoptionsinsider.com. Try to put somewhere in there, you know, question for option block or whatever show you're writing in for. A little bit harder on the old social media. Don't get as much room <laughs> in there. Uh, but in general, find us on Facebook at theoptionsinsider.com, or excuse me, theoptionsinsider, or on twitter.com slash options, or indeed on stock twits over there as Options Insider. I'm going to kick things off with a question from the ever so uh, memorable handle of RJR357. <laughs> he or she writes, hey, I got an option block question. On the SIBO blog, you see comments such as bulls are piling into XYZ or calls outnumber puts six to one. Is it prudent to follow the herd? Is this info of any value? I'm guessing this is the big money traders. Great show. Well, first off, thank you for that, Mr. or Mrs. RJR357. And I'm trying to intuit what you actually mean by this question. There's a couple different ways we could take it, uh, because, of course, blogs have comments. <laughs> and so maybe you're – I haven't been on the SIBO uh, SIBO option hub i believe you're referring to in a while uh so they do have comments on those articles so maybe you're you're referring to listener comments in which case just in general it's probably a good practice never to do anything or act or trade at all upon something you see in a comment on the website i'm not going to mock our commenters but just in general commenters across the board on the web who knows what they're up to what their agendas are so if you're trading all that stuff 
please stop. Uh, but to the other side, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume you're referring to uh, the actual SIBO options hub, of which I know a few people who write for that. Mr. Sebastian is one of them. And there's a few others. We don't contribute anything ourselves at the options insider. We make our own <laughs> options hub, if you will, our own options aggregator. But I do see some of the stuff they have uh, going up over there. And some of it could indeed fall into the realm of the unusual activity. And if that's the case, that's what you're reading, then it's kind of exactly analogous to what we just talked about, what Andrew and I just went through on the odd block. Uh, you know, uh, unusual activity has its uses. You know, it has its value. In terms of predictive indicators, there are a number of studies out there that show that it is one of the more effective in terms of indicating uh, that something is afoot in an underlying, in a variety of different capacities. It could be just volume ahead of events, and often it's even better ahead of surprise events, surprise announcements. Options volume is a great predictor uh, of what's about, what's about to happen and what could potentially happen. So when Andrew and I and others go through that on this network and on this show, that's what we're trying to show you is that, hey, you know, this is something that could potentially be happening. But we always say you know, the smart money is not, the size money, excuse me, is not always the smart money is because someone put up 10,000 contracts. How many did we just talk about in the odd block? That didn't really make a heck of a lot of sense. Uh, so size money, not always smart money. Just because you see someone buying upside calls doesn't mean you have to. In fact, what we, what we often say here on this program and indeed on the network is that these trades, they the best way to follow them if you want to is cause, because they create distortions in the options and you can take advantage of those distortions to express a similar view. For example, someone's coming in and buying 10,000 of some very liquid upside calls. Uh, you can take advantage of that if you had a similar viewpoint, if you thought that person may be right or the stock was going to rally. You could just buy a vertical and buy the at the money, sell the out of the money, and leg into a vertical at a fantastic value, a fantastic level that you never could otherwise because our friend there so generously created that distortion for you to take advantage of. So that's the best way if you are indeed going to, to follow that to, uh, to do it. So does it, unusual activity have any value? Well, we do a lot of it, so I don't have to wager yes. <laughs> it is it is. In Interesting content that is worthy of note. Mr. Rock Lobster, you also get your hands wet in a lot of unusual activity here on the website and indeed on the network. What do you have to say to our friend here who I believe is asking about uh, the validity of that kind of content in general? The only thing I would say about that volume is sometimes that there could be stock component against it. Sometimes it could be closing volume. You know, you got to it's it's always put it this way. The. It's good to know what the flow is, meaning, you know, are people piling in and buying calls or people piling in and buying puts? You know, what are they doing? But you also want to see if there's any counter paper, if it's closing paper. So in general, I get some pretty good ideas from uh, option uh, option volume just for names that I would not normally have looked at before. And every once in a while, there's an interesting trade in there. So, um, And again, it's good. I like to see when when – when customers are buying stuff in large size, that generally, you know, it gets my interest because it moves the needle, especially it moves volatility. So anything anything that gets moved, I'm always interested in. Yeah, I think it's always a good thing to see, particularly in names you're trading, what else is going up out there. You know, that that's of note, I would think, to someone who's trading XYZ underlying and the options and, hey, something big went up out there. You probably want to be informed of that. Uncle Mike, do you have occasion to visit uh, the CBOE blog, as he refers to it? And in general, what's your take on all of the uh, unusual activity and trying to follow what he refers to as the big money traders? Well, in terms of visiting the blog, typically, no. I, I would caution blog reading in general uh, just because it, if someone's not licensed, it could be a legalized bait and switch or it could be a legalized pump and dump, so to speak. Uh, meaning that if someone just says, buy this call, buy this call, they might already own that call. And then as soon as everybody buys the call, then they sell the call. And, well, we all know how that ends. So the first thing I would caution people on that, now the CBOE site is pretty, uh, they're a pretty reliable name in a lot of ways. So I don't necessarily think you have to um, be too concerned along those lines. I'm guessing they monitor that fairly closely, although I don't know for sure. Uh, but in terms of looking at the unusual activity and how it works, the main thing that I just want to add to what Andrew said is make sure you understand why it's unusual, meaning that if all of a sudden you see eight bajillion calls going up, if someone's selling eight bajillion calls, then you need to have an understanding that it's a, a bearish trade and not a bullish trade. So Really look into everything. Look to see if you're seeing that kind of volume in another option. Perhaps if you see 
volume is really high on the XYZ50 call. Well, if also you see similar volume on the XYZ45 call, then that tells you it was a spread of some sort. And we go through this, we've been going through this every day on the on the odd block for as long as this show has been on. So what I would suggest doing, if you're going to look at unusual activity and go that route, do your own little odd block before you even do anything. Well said, sir. Just don't call it the odd block because then my lawyers have to come after you and that's a whole... That's a whole conversation for another day. Uh, speaking of uh, conversations, let's move on to a question here from uh, from Pedro. Pedro I, and he writes, Hey, I understand how overall market and industry direction might influence a stock's direction. Is there something similar regarding volatility uh, that can be observed where an overall sentiment might influence or work with an options implied volatility as a new recruit, uh, wonderful, wonderful content. Thank you. Uh, well, you're welcome there, <laughs> Pedro. Uh, he's referring to kind of the conversation we've had before on the program about how um, how overwhelming sentiment, whether it's coming from technical indicators or others, might exhibit themselves in an options volatility. And there's a couple of ways. You know, we talked about this before, just to kind of refresh a little bit. You know, if there's some sort of overall sentiment that. Uh, XYZ is going to rally aggressively in the near term. You may see a, a profusion of call buyers, near term upside call buyers coming into that name. We see that happen a lot around earnings with some names that are that are popular with the zealot class of traders, you know, formerly Apple, currently Facebook and Teslas and a few others that exhibit that on a regular basis. So we might see a lot of that going into those types of events. And that's typically where that kind of sentiment would would bear itself out somewhere in the volatility skew if it is indeed pronounced maybe there is some analyst recommendation maybe there's something else uh, afoot out there people think it's going to move by a certain time frame you're going to see that playing out in the options within that time frame and typically in the volatility skew if it's going to drop you'll see the the puts being very rich in a certain area perhaps or you might see the calls being very cheap or vice versa uh you know so that's probably where you would see it play out uh, maybe Mr. Rock Lobster will, will give you guys a chance to, to weigh into kind of similar to a question we had before with how technical indicators exhibit themselves in the underlying. But if you have something to say to our friend here, Mr. Pedro, who wants to know where an overall sentiment might influence our work with an options volatility and where it can be observed uh, in an option. That is, I guess I can answer that where overall sentiment that is. Um I can read it for you again. It's a little bit of an obtuse question. It's a good yes, one. Yes, because uh, you didn't put there, it on the. You didn't put it on the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, on it came in kind of late. It says, "Is there something similar?" He writes. I'll read it again. Uh, discovered the, discovered us recently. I discovered how overall market industry direction might influence a stock's direction. Is there something similar regarding volatility that can be observed where an overall sentiment might influence or work with an options implied volatility? Uh, so there you go, sir. Make for it. Make of it what you will. Um, I think one thing that sometimes for industry is, uh, you know, I'm looking for what's going on with the volatility, let's say the ETF for an industry. So, you know, right right now, one of the things that uh, the CBAS and I have been discussing is, you know, oil is making new lows, but the vol is not making new highs, which kind of lends itself to believe that maybe the sell off is it's running out of room because there's not a lot of volatility in the sell off, meaning the paper is not as worried about it going down a whole bunch as it was in, uh, let's say, January. And I think you're seeing that in a couple of things. So normally when you see a lot of volatility, um, usually from a sentiment point of view, that's not that's usually not good for the underlying. I say usually. So I, if everything was 100%, life would be a lot easier, but it's not like that. So uh, generally, you know, when you see increasing vol, you expect increasing movement. And the thing when you look about implied vol is it is the sum total of all the market participants' viewpoint about, you know, where they think things are – what – where they think things are going. And when people start buying options, that means they're scared witless of the underlying. So just kind of keep that in mind uh, when, you, when you try to use volatility as a sentiment indicator. Mr. Uncle Mike, anything to add here for our friend Pedro with a very interesting kind of 10,000-foot question here? No, that's a good question, Pedro. I, I, Andrew, I think, said it all in that regard. Well, there you go. 
Uncle Mike has nothing to add, Mr. Pedro. So there you go. <laughs> uh, let's see. We got time for a couple more. A lot of people writing in with questions about other platforms today. Cebo Hub, others. We got coming in. One to come in here from uh, Charles. Charles V. He writes, "Hey, my friend, recommended Doe as an options starter platform. It seems a little silly to me. How do you like it? This is the." Uh, Kind of a starter software that Sazanoff and those guys are doing. It works with TD Ameritrade, essentially. Kind of like a an intro uh, to options thing for uh, TD Ameritrade. Uh, I actually personally haven't haven't played with it, uh, so I can't really uh, comment as to uh, its efficacy or not. If they say if they say it seems silly, uh, that's that's their perspective. Um, but uh, yeah, I haven't really had a chance to use it. And I, I know maybe what he means by silly. Maybe I know they are trying. I think with some of this stuff to to make it a little bit more conversational and approachable. Other brokers have tried this uh, trading block slash money block, and others have tried to kind of take a step back from the dense terminology that surrounds options and make things a lot more straightforward. In fact, TD Ameritrade, I believe, just launched a a separate tool that essentially just says, hey, come on in, tell us what underlying you're looking at, tell us what direction you think is going to move in, what time frame, and hit pretty much calculate, and it's going to spit out Uh, some options trades for you and other brokers have done that hey are you bullish and bearish or bearish on this hey do you want some income do you want a little bit x and trying to cloak options related questions in a vernacular that's much more approachable uh, to an options layman quite frankly and i think doe is trying to do uh, something uh, similar and so i kind of wish these kinds of efforts well because i think we quite frankly need a lot more of that in in the options space these terminology these terms like you know iron condor iron butterfly and things like that that are just obtuse, their origins are lost in time, front spread, back spread, etc. It's off-putting to a lot of people who want to get into this product for the first time. So if we can make something a little bit more approachable, I think that's a good thing. I don't think it resonated too well with the trading block stuff, but I think they're they're trying. I think uh, the folks over there at Trade King have tried uh, are trying something similar. TD Ameritrade obviously putting a lot of money into this initiative. So you're probably going to see more of this, not less, in the near future. Uh, but aside from his specific question, I, I can't answer it. I haven't used it. Uh, Mr. Rock Lobster, Mr. Tucson, I think you want to add here to our friend, uh, Mr. Charles V. I have no clue about the dough platform. <laughs> I guess that's a resounding no from all of us here, uh, Mr. V. Sorry, can't help you on that one. Uh, but yeah, in general, I think this is a good, a good initiative for the space, trying to make options a little bit more approachable. We've done that ourselves here at the Options. That's why we created the first Options podcast. We wanted to use a new medium and a new format in an attempt to reach potentially a new audience. That's why we were on the first pretty much Options users on Twitter. That's why our handle is at Options. You know, we've always been big fans of using new approaches, particularly new media uh, and new formats to try to go after new audiences. Because I knew when I launched Options Insider, I can get that you know, 50-odd, 60-year-old guy with gray hair and X amount of dollars in his account. I knew I can get that audience. Uh, But if you want to get anything else, you want to get a younger audience, you want to get women more interested in this, uh, then you have to kind of approach them in different ways. And so uh, seeing people trying different approaches, uh, I'm always a fan of that. Some of them, like similar ones like this, haven't really worked that well in the past. Uh, We'll see how some of these current endeavors unfold in the marketplace. Unfortunately, all the time we have great questions from everybody for this week and now it's time for us to keep on rolling into our final segment it's time for around the block it's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode it's time for around the block all right everybody welcome to around the block like the name says this is the portion of the program where we've picked out what we're watching what we're keeping an eye on for the rest of this week Uh, not a heck of a lot in terms of earnings uh, left on the horizon i think we just have uh, jd dot com which is not really not really a big name to keep an eye on speaking of earnings i neglected to mention uh, one of our ones you guys uh, like to write in a lot about had their first announcement this week that is of course fitbit ticker symbol fit and all you guys who were writing in about a month or two ago after the ipo and when the options first listed and saying hey uh, should i write let's say the uh, 20 odd handle puts or things like that and is that safe and then of course the stock never really looked back. Well, they took it a little bit on the chin uh, post their first earnings announcement uh, closing today over there on Fitbit. 44 half, roughly off another seven handles 
or so out there. So this thing was trading into the 50s uh, not too long ago, hit a high of about 52, 51.90 actually. And then the earnings came along and kind of clipped their legs out from under them. They, they got a little frothy. It's a very heated, very competitive marketplace. And, uh, of course, the Apple Watch, the, one of the big players out there in the wearables as well. So it's a heated marketplace. But, yeah, this name has been on a run quite a bit. Mr. Rockloff, so you guys been keeping an eye on uh, Fitbit in the old pit chat over there. Any interesting trades lining up for your mentees, A? And then, B, what are you keeping an eye on for the rest of this week into the weekend? Um, not trades in Fitbit. We most there's been, some, there's been some chuckles. There's been some Fitbit chuckles because – Okay, they're making a little wristy piece of hardware and it trades at 70 times earnings. But, you know, I guess it could grow. You know, it could grow. Spoken like <laughs> a diehard fundamentalist, sir. <laughs> it, it Someone who grow. lives in the woods of Maine. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, buy the band, maybe don't buy the stock, but hey. Uh, what are we looking at? Let's say non farm payrolls. The market's looking a little bit sketchy and ugly. And the reality is the Fed is getting out of the propping the market up business. And we just got a deal. Everybody's got a deal. That's what it is now. It's you're in dealsville. You know, deal with uh, the fact that the equity markets are going to have to stand on their own. And while I don't think the market's going to crash, I think a lot of our a lot of that great upside, uh, save for, you know, it's maybe some selective names is. You know, it's this is like I said, 2015 is the iron condor paradise year. <laughs> the market's not going anywhere, and all that all that out of the money juice is going to go to nothing. So, so far it's worked out pretty good, and it will probably continue to be like that. Iron condor paradise year is that the official uh, option pit suggestion for this year? Um, so far, it yes, we have mostly sold premium, and it has mostly worked out okay. Welcome to the year of the iron condor paradise. I like it. I like yes. it. Uncle Mike, what are you keeping an eye on for the rest of this week? And then what type of year of paradise is it for you? Well, I ha have to say the first thing that goes through my head is the Weird Al song about Amish paradise that he parodied <laughs> from Gangster Paradise from Coolio. So uh, maybe Weird Al is going to be uh, doing another parody on some song saying, Sp been spending most of my life living in a condor paradise. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, with that being said, uh, yeah, just looking at non-farm coming up tomorrow and, uh, just with what we have going on, uh, not a lot. And when we did have stuff going on, the market didn't move anyway. We had Greece. We had a country that was about to go belly up. We had nuclear war. We were on the brink of, in theory, nuclear war with Iran. We had China's markets collapsing and nothing happened. So... I don't know. Something's going to happen at some point, I guess. Well, let's smoke. Maybe. Smoking. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I like it. That's the technical term. Something will happen at some point, I guess, says Uncle Mike with his uh, trademark 48% guarantee. I give the 50% guarantee. That's Kavanaugh that plays the oh, rules. Kavanaugh plays the double zeros. That's true. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that, Uncle Mike. And the Rock Lobster. Unfortunately, that's all we have for the Around the Block segments. Also, all the time we have for this episode of the Option Block. But before we go, as always, let me check in really quickly with each of my cohorts one more time. See what they have cooking. That may interest you. We'll start with you, Uncle Mike of the 50% guarantee. What's coming on the pike in the land of RCM? Well, the 100% guarantee is if you contact me, I'll be more than happy to contact you back in one way, shape, or form about trading under the RCM umbrella through either TD Ameritrade or Interactive Brokers. Uh, we do get beneficial commission rates, uh, and it might be a fit for you. It just kind of depends on what style of trading you do and how it would work. Um, and with that, we do provide advice on trading. So with all that being said, if that's something with which you are interested in, feel free to give me a call at 312-212-3531 or send me an email at mtosaw at rcmfs.com. And Mr. Rock Lobster, you said it's going to be a condor paradise. You know I'm, I'm much more partial to the iron fly. So is it an iron fly paradise as well? Because as we all know, the iron condor is an iron fly for cowards. <laughs> A lot of talk. A lot of talk on that one. Oh, it just so happens that we are going to have an iron fly and an iron condor class on the 22nd of August. 
Ah, I so, see. So, so one for the babies and one for the men in the audience. Exactly, exactly. So I, you know, and I'm not gonna. So one of you will pick one, one of you will pick the other, but also it's pricing and trying to put these things on in a way that makes uh, sense, so you don't get taken to the woodshed. Um, and learning how to manage them and looking for conditions. So we, you know, looked at a trade for a couple of days in Disney, and it's just we're kind of trying to be patient until it stops moving so much. Um, so sometimes that's what it is. So. What fun is being patient, sir? Pull the trigger. Ah, I know. Just throw it on. Throw them bones. <laughs> Been <laughs> spending most my life living in a condor paradise. Oh, no. You that wi- is you've wired him up now. See what you've done, sir? You've got Uncle we Mike singing released, on the show. That may be a first. We have, we have released the voice of St. Charles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listeners, if you too see if we can do this, if you too would like to live in a condor paradise, uh, then surf on over. to. I'm not sure what that what that would even be like. But if you want to check it out for yourself, surf on over to optionpit.com. Check out those events. I recommend the Iron Fly one. But if you want to go a little more gently into the good night, then go for the Iron Condor. I won't hold it against you. And, of course, if you want a little bit more uh, a little bit more activity, a little, a little bit of hand-holding perhaps when you're executing your options trades or perhaps just to save some money, give Uncle Mike a call over there at RCM. He may have a little bit of time for you. He's getting pretty busy over there, all the, all the listeners calling him up over there. But he may have a little bit of time left over for you. So get in while the getting is good. And on behalf of Uncle Mike... And the Rock Lobster he of the Contour Paradise fame. And, of course, myself. I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the show. And, of course, for sending in such great questions. Keep them coming. And we'll see you next time right here on the Option Block. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 